at a high level works the same as pretty much every other static analysis tool, which is you go from source code, you parse it into some sort of intermediate representation, such as an abstract syntax tree or a graph. Uh, we then uh, take some security checks and we sort of pattern match those together in the engine and then out pops uh, security bugs. So I, I could go into this more detail, but I, I don't think sort of the details are relevant for now. Uh, but at a high level, that's how it works. Okay, so uh, enough talking. Let's uh, get into rule writing because I, I think that's more fun. Okay, so basically uh, how I would like this to work is uh, I'm going to do an example and uh, you can all watch. And then uh, I actually have a tweet, Twitter thread where I'm going to tweet like a, a challenge and then you can all uh, tweet your solutions uh, back at me. <laughs> so threading on Twitter is hard. So this may be a, a disaster, but I am uh, optimistic. We will, we will see how it goes. Okay, so uh, again, SEMGREP is uh, open source. It's on GitHub. You can uh, pip install it or homebrew install it or run it as like a Linux binary or run it as Docker. Um, you can do whatever you want, but basically this uh, live editor is just a nice way to write um, SEMGREP patterns in uh, a nice UI. Uh, without having to uh, install anything. And also it's very convenient with uh, sharing, uh, sharing what you're working on with other people. So, so let's look at an example. Um, so this is uh, just basically like a web UI around like forking to Docker in the background. There's, there's no magic here. Um, okay, so you can choose like a bunch of different languages. Um, this is a sort of simple editor where you can uh, write patterns that those patterns will be run against this code. And then the uh, right-hand side will show like, what are you matching? Um, so let's just say we want to find all calls to exec. So basically, again, it's just like source code. So we're just gonna do exec. And then there are maybe two or three abstractions that are useful for SEMGRIP. Um, so one is the ellipsis operator, which is basically saying, there can be zero or more arguments. I don't care what they are. So if we do that, let's see uh, what we matched. So we can see here that we matched this um, string literal. We matched uh, this variable getting passed in. Uh, we did not match some exec because again, it, that is not uh, a function named exec. Uh, this white space didn't matter. These uh, multi-line uh, call didn't matter. And, and note that we did not find the comment or uh, exec being called in a string literal. So these would probably be hard to find with grep. Uh, these would probably be false positives with grep. But again, we just wrote like a very simple pattern and it did uh, what we intended. Um, so one thing uh, that I think is especially neat is um, SEMGREP is smarter than just sort of a, a naive abstract syntax tree matcher. It actually is aware of sort of source code semantics. So here, we are importing exec locally, like locally aliasing exec as safe function. And then we're calling safe function uh, on something else uh, here, just like some variable called user input. So note that we are still flagging this because it is actually calling exec, but my pattern is naive to that. Like I didn't have to say, oh, well, I guess, you know, maybe something could be aliased or this other fancy thing could happen. Uh, sort of our goal for SEMGREP is how can we make it um, as abstracted to the user where they basically just say, this is my intention, this is what I want to match. Uh, and then we do the smart thing and, and handle the um, complex cases uh, behind the scenes. So you don't have to worry about it in your patterns, ideally. Um, okay, so uh, let's go into this a, a little bit more detail. So if we wanted to say, uh, so basically like the ellipsis operator is kind of like dot star in regexes where it's like, just match whatever, I don't care. Um, sometimes you want to actually match and uh, grab a reference to something, sort of like um, like a capture group in a regular expression where you don't know what the value is, but you want to reference it later. So that uh, we have, uh, again, another abstraction uh, for some grab patterns called meta variables, which are basically like a dollar sign and then some alphanumeric uh, label. Um, so when I say uh, dollar sign X, we're saying uh, this is a meta variable. So find calls to exec uh, with just one argument. And um, yeah, so here we're still matching the same things. But if we were to say 
um, add an additional argument here. Now we uh, are no longer matching this case because our pattern, uh, this meta variable is saying we assume that there's only one argument to exec. And because this one has two, um, uh, it's no longer matching. So if we wanted to say only match uh, calls to exec with uh, exactly two arguments, we could say, um, you know, pass in two argument or two meta variables. So that would match uh, these two things respectively. We could also say, so we can actually combine meta variables and the ellipsis operator. So again, the ellipsis operator is like zero or more things. So if we did uh, X and then uh, dot, 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 that's actually going to match So now we're saying match calls to exec with at least one argument, which will be bound to X, uh, but there could be more. Uh, yeah, so that is sort of the, the basics. Um, let's see, I guess now's a good time. Um, so this simple editor is uh, just sort of like a nice UI, but uh, at its core, Sangrep rules are actually YAML files. So if you click to the advanced tab, you can sort of see what's what's going on underneath the hood. So here, uh, this is the structure of basically this compiles down to this. Um, so ID is basically uh, the name of whatever you're uh, finding. So we could change this to say like find exec. The pattern is like, this is what I'm looking for. Um, here's some message. Uh, this looks like leftover from something else. Um, so we could say find calls to exec. Yeah, and I'll show you a cool thing in a second. Um, and severity is like warning, info, uh, et cetera. So one thing that's nice about uh, meta variables is you can actually use them in your message. So if we run this, we can see that this X is matching here to user input, here to ls, here to some var, to some var, uh, et cetera. So, so basically, like this is useful for if you are um, like trying to give developers very direct um, feedback and helpful contextual. Like you don't want to just say, "Hey, this is bad." Ideally, you would like to say, "Oh, in function foo, you're doing this, and you're passing it." argument bar, and that's why this is bad. So you can basically anything you match in a pattern, you can include in um, your uh, message. And we're actually going to see how uh, powerful that is with um, like auto auto suggesting uh, fixes for code um, towards the end of this. Um, OK, so uh, one last thing. Um, <laughs> and then and then you've learned like 90% of what there is to know about SEMGREP. So I know it sounds like you've just started, but basically the primitives that I've told you so far, uh, the ellipsis operator, meta variables, um, that's going to get you most of the way there. And there's just like a couple of other uh, useful things. So one is, you know, sometimes you want to find um, like not just one pattern. Ideally, you would like to say, you know, find all cases where this is true and this is true, or this or that, or this but not that, sort of like a Boolean composition of patterns. Um, and and SimGrep allows you to do that. So if you sort of click this plus, um, there's a series of other things you can do where you can say, OK, like the code could be this or this, or it needs to be inside this, um, like inside this class or function. Or you could say, and is not this, uh, and so forth. So let's look at how we can um, do some interesting like pattern combination. So here, we could say, let's find any code, um, any call to exec, zero or more arguments. We don't care. And let's filter out the cases where exec is being called. And um, so this is also a special syntax if you do um, dot, dot, dot within quotes. This means like any hard coded string. I don't care uh, what it is. Like it, the value could be anything, but um, you know, just match it anyway. So like, let's find all calls to exec, but filter out the cases where the first argument is a string literal. So uh, the intuition here is like, if you know, this is just a hard coded string and attacker can't influence it. So it's probably not dangerous. So by adding this additional clause, we're making uh, our query higher signal and, and less noisy. So if we do this, we can see that we are 
uh, filtering out this case. So this is a string literal. So we're like, ah, that's that's safe actually. Um, and then we're still finding the other cases that potentially could be vulnerable. Um, okay. So yeah, basically uh, ellipsis operator, zero or more things, uh, meta variables like catch a reference to something. Um, you can combine clauses and um, there's like some other stuff, but but really that's most of it. Um, yeah, so any questions? Yeah, can I ask a couple of questions? Can you just show me that advanced thing again? So I just completely missed that one. The, where you add, the, yeah, so you put the variables in there, right? Very cool. Um, so so one of the areas where I feel that this is really powerful is is to replicate what we know. See, my, the, the biggest thing I've found is that we, in security, we tend to sometimes go for the unicorn stuff and we tend to go for like really complex stuff. And I, more and more, I, I'm like back to basics. I'm like, look, Keys of vulnerability, right? I found this. Automate the discovery of that. Like, you know, it's almost like, hey, you know, somebody submitted a bug bounty. Show me everything that person did, right? And if you cannot see that, then we have a problem, right? Or like uh, we review source code and we found a problem or somebody, you know, it's almost like there's a natural discovery of vulnerabilities, right? I would say in, in an environment, right? I, either you know, people paying attention or by accident or by being exploited or or even by, you know, as we get more security champions in board. Like, I think there's a natural stream of discovering of vulnerabilities okay. where I think this really, that's a very sweet spot, is allowing to ask a very simple question, which is write a rule to find that, right? Put it on the CI CD pipeline, put the fix in and show me that rule changing, right? Being being kind of you know basically stop being there right and and i and i feel that then the only question is how complex is the rule right but i always take the view that if a human can find it you know we should be able to write a rule for it right like you know whatever the human is doing you should be able to codify it right yeah. and, I, and that's why i think this is very interesting and and i think it's very interesting to to then find you know those patterns and and to have those kind of ways to um you know to automate that discovery which is which is really really cool and um yeah so i'm looking forward to seeing more the uh, one more question i had is the so you don't do intra file you know kind of uh ast right so is your ast limited to one file or do you glue multiple files together yeah so that's that's a good question um so one uh Let's see, one of the reasons why I included this uh, slide is, so yeah. th there are some like fundamental trade-offs when you're doing static analysis in terms of like speed versus analysis complexity and precision versus, um, you know, ease of rule writing. So, so we've sort of taken the opinionated stance that um, we're focusing more on like speed and ease of rule writing over um, sort of like fully being able to express any possible code flow. Um, so I, I actually interned at um, Fortify when I was a grad student and I, I built static analysis tools in grad school with uh, my colleagues. And when you're doing interprocedural data flow analysis, there are clever things you can do, but fundamentally because of like halting problem things, there's just always going to be imprecisions. And in my experience doing security consulting and like helping tune commercial SaaS tools for customers, oftentimes the longer the call chain was, the more likely it was be to, uh, to be a false positive. Um, so sort of like the intuition behind focusing on local analysis is we we know that by constraining the problem, we can be higher signal and, and less false positives. And also we can be a lot faster. Um, if we wanted to do interprocedural uh, data flow analysis, we would have to be slower and we probably would need a buildable environment. So because we sort of by design want to not do those things. Um, so. The, like the Yuan, the um, sort of the lead author of this tool, like he's built interprocedural data flow analyses before, and we probably will add multi-file stuff like eventually. Um, but sort of right now, it, it's not a focus. Um, not not necessarily because uh, it's difficult or well, it is hard, but but it's not impossible from a technical point of view. There's no fundamental limitation why we can't. It, it's just like sort of not uh, vision aligned with with where we're heading uh, currently. And I think conceptually, another way I think about it is like. If like think of like a how people do code reviews, like when someone uh, when a developer creates a new uh, pull request and like someone is doing a code audit out of that, usually you're looking at the diff, and you're probably not reasoning mentally about how um, you know oh this 
two line change in this file because of this existing code, like 20 files away, it's actually vulnerable now. I, I think that if reasoning about many, many files um, to understand the security properties of new changes, like if you need to do that, I would say that's actually kind of like an anti-pattern and that ideally you code sort of tooling and libraries and infrastructure such that you can reason about security properties locally. Um, it's not necessarily easy, but I, I think that's sort of um, a powerful way to go. Um, you you basically will only look inside one function, right? So even if the same function is in the same file, you won't follow the like the same data from one function to the other function. Yeah. Uh, you, so each each uh, pattern runs on like one file at a time. So you can um, reason about like, oh, this is in global scope, and then this happens in a function. Like you can't do stuff like that. Um, but uh, yes, doing um, sort of like complex uh, taint analysis is um, it's on the roadmap, but it's sort of not currently a focus. Yeah, but but I'll say, but but if if you have the if the same file has, for example, uh, a call being made, right? Like for example, that that thing you showed, which was really cool, which was the fact that you can pick up the fact that there's an ally a, a layers, right? So for the like that one, right, as a safe function, right? If there was the data being passed into another function, and then you know would they use it? Would you like do you follow that? You know the the AST. Does your AST stays within the same function, or does it you know actually resolves that this is actually going to be calling another another method inside the same file? Um, yes, I, I'd have to uh, look at a concrete example. I think I know what you're saying, but uh, yeah, the answer is. Uh, Yes, uh, we can either do that now, or uh, it's something that we could add soon. It's not um, cool. since in the same file, we, we could do that without too much difficulty. So, so for the C sharp guys on the call, one of the things that I did with those two platform was this insane thing called I call it method streams. What I did was I used refactoring to basically take a method, find all the calls made on that method, and recursively, and then I would basically put, create a new file that had all the methods from the original one. It was great for code review, but I think for this would be quite cool, actually. So yeah, so they, 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 we should dig some of that stuff. All right, then. Oh, no more questions for me. Uh, I think there's other questions that somebody asked you, so go for them. Oh yeah, thanks for the great questions. Um, okay, so uh, Arthur asked, can you have a rule that combines both? Um, yeah, totally. Um, let's do that. And then, yeah, if we did something like... Yeah. Yeah, so uh, meta variables and um, sort of quotes, dot, dot, dot. Yeah, you can, you can arb I'm basically teaching you the primitives, like what are the pattern building blocks? Uh, and you can arbitrarily combine them in one or more patterns. Um, so yeah, so here we are finding like, okay, the first argument can be anything. And the second argument um, is specifically a string literal. So that would match this, but not this. Um, so let's see, Kevin asks, uh, since SEMgrep is using an AST-based approach, does that mean that you can't explicitly search for things that might show up in comments and are only limited to searching code? Um, yeah, that's uh, a great question, Kevin. Um, so yes, uh, our parser currently, I believe, um, throws away uh, comments a bit. Like a, we didn't sort of intend for people to be able to uh, pattern match on comments. Um, this is a design decision. It's not a fundamental limitation, like we could change it so that you could do that. Um, it just hasn't really been a need. Um, so the answer is currently no, but there's no technical reason why this is the case. We, we could do that if you want to. 